Um, but it's a great pleasure to come and give this talk. And uh, Andres was, was keen that I, I try to present something about Bayesian statistics to uh, a very general audience. And, and uh, uh, some of you I know in the, in the audience are really are experts in Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and related things. And um, maybe you'll only get uh, things rather towards the end of a lecture. Uh, but I'm hope hoping there'll be something for everybody in this. And um, you know, I mean, Thomas Bayes and, and Bayesian statistics has actually had a remarkable journey over the last uh, 250 years or so. Um, and I want to just talk about some, some highlights for me, which are to do with my perspectives uh, as, as, a, as a Bayesian in terms of issues that have happened, largely due to kind of computational advances. Um, so that's really going to be the sort of main focus of my talk. But let's go back. Uh, start off uh, uh, right at the beginning, and this is a picture, many of you will have seen this picture before, this is Thomas Bayes. Um, this, I'm sorry the pictures aren't brilliant here, but uh, this is, I mean, this, this is typical of academics in his day. Um, they did everything, essentially. They weren't just mathematicians, they were, they were theologians, they were philosophers, they were chemists, etc. And uh, Thomas Bayes was, was no exception. He was uh, uh, he was actually trained in mathematics and theology, which go very well together in some senses, at least he thought so. He became a non-conformist minister, um, uh, in English clergyman, um, um, back in the um, early 18th century. Um, and uh, during his lifetime, he did actually uh, publish um, two, uh, two papers. Um, the first was actually a theological paper, which you might expect a clergyman to actually um, publish. And I think it was something to do with um, why, why, why God does nice things for lots of people or something. I can't remember the exact title, but it was, it was actually quite an um, obviously theological paper. And, and the second paper was actually um, interesting in that it was a, it was a very uh, strong defense of Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton, of course, was the sort of leading scientist in the whole of the uh, well, arguably in the whole, whole of the world in, in those days, and certainly within the, w within the UK and in England, and was at the time president of Royal Society. Um, and um, th th there was another clergyman that came along, and his name was uh, Bishop Berkeley, who was actually a Church of England clergyman. Now, if you, you probably don't know much about the church in England, well, the nonconformist church and the Church of England church uh, had wildly different, differing views about uh, all, all kinds of aspects of theology and religion. Um, so they probably didn't naturally get on in a theological uh, um, setting. But actually, they decided to have an argument not about theology, but about mathematics. And uh, um, it was Bishop Berkeley who actually came up with um, a paper in which he, he completely questioned the logic behind calculus, uh, the, the, the Newtonian calculus as it been invented. And of course, um, Thomas Bayes didn't like this, and, and he um, he, see, he wrote a paper in defense of, 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 uh, of uh, Newton. So that was, that was his second paper. Of course, we don't quote that paper very much, but it was influential in the time in that uh, Isaac Newton, there he is, Isaac Newton, um, was actually very impressed by this, because obviously he would be if somebody wrote that, you know, did your defending for you, um, and actually elected him as a fellow of the Royal Society in something like 1742. And uh, so that was, that was his scientific career in some sense. I'm sure he, he, he basically did uh, interesting scientific things after that, but he didn't publish papers after that. Um, but I, I think that that story, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a historian about statistics in any sense, so I don't know too much about all the details, but I just find it fascinating, the idea that you have this notion of the, the theologians arguing about mathematics uh, you know, in a very uh, rigorous way, big, vigorous way, um, that they were arguing about uh, mathematics rather than theology. Whereas actually, um, Isaac Newton, of course, we'll, we'll remember him for his uh, uh, fantastic scientific uh, mathematical physics advances. Um, he was spending most of his time at the time not doing science at all, but he was actually more interested in theology. So they sort of they sort of, sort of swapped roles in some sense here. Um, Bayes, of course, the reason why I remember Bayes is nothing to do with those two papers, but it's to do with the third paper, which was actually published after his death. It was uh, found in papers that were found in his, uh, in his house and published uh, posthumously by a friend. Um, and the, the paper was entitled An Essay Towards Solving the Doctrines of Chance. Um, and it was published um, basically sometime after his death. And this, this um, as, well, what was this paper? Well, I'm going to take you through this paper now, not, not in the language that he would have used. Um, 
But it's a very simple idea, and, and um, many of you will have already seen Bayes' theorem. But essentially, it just talks about uh, conditional probabilities. You know, we often want to make conditional probabilities about things conditional, conditional on other things that we might have observed. And uh, well, this is Bayes' theorem, and it essentially says that, uh, well, if you've got conditional probability here, this is just the probability that y, some random variable takes a value y, given that x takes a value x, this is just uh, the ratio of the probabilities of, well, y taking value y and x taking the value x, normalized by probability that x takes the value x. And this is, this is often taken as pretty much the definition of conditional probability. And there are lots of nice properties of conditional probability which we, we, which we know. And Bayes' simple observation, really, was that actually um, this doesn't need to be actually written in a non-symmetric way in this way. Okay, we can actually also write the same thing for the probability of x equals x, conditional on y equals y, and symmetrize this relationship, and get some relationship between, and I've abbreviated a notation here, so some relationship between the probability of x given x is the probability of y given y, uh, sorry, probability of x given y is just related to the probability of y given x times the probability of x divided by the probability of y. Um, and basically, uh, so this is so something, I mean, I'm sure he didn't express this in this way, but of course, the idea about Bayes' theorem uh, requires some kind of symmetric relationship and then and some kind of way of setting up these two random objects, x and y, to be random variables uh, on, uh, on some common probability space. So we can talk about randomness for both of them together. So what on earth has this got to do with statistics? Well, in statistics, we're always wanting to say something about probabilistic mechanisms which might have created data conditional on something that we've observed. And the thing that we might have observed is data. So it might be very natural, and seems extremely natural, to want to actually st stipulate, uh, uh, to, to, to actually construct some way of doing inference on the basis of conditional probability. Um, so if you just look at the, the top here, so, so, so classical statistics, or frequented statistics, actually takes a sort of halfway house view of the way to do statistical modeling. It specifies some uh, statistical model. It's the probability, probabilities associated with what you observe, y, conditional on the theta taking the value of theta. Well, theta is just indexing, in some sense, the possible random distributions that might have been making up this data. Um, so classical statistics specifies this conditional probability, but it actually makes the stipulation that it's not interpreted fully as a conditional probability in the sense that theta and y have to be random together. So in some sense, it stops here and doesn't insist that there's any kind of randomness for theta. Theta in the, in the classical setting is not random. Um, so there's an asymmetry very much between y and theta. And for that reason, many, many Bayesians and many... Uh, um, Philosophers actually believe that this is not not necessarily a sort of sensible thing to do, even though it may well be pragmatic. So the classical statistical paradigm goes on to do things like um, maximize this as a function of theta and say whatever the value of theta which maximizes that, that ought to be a pretty sensible thing to do. And they'll be very successful in proving mathematics to support that statement. However, going back to Bayes' theorem, we can actually go further and we can say, well, maybe we can try and interpret this really as a conditional probability statement. And, of course, this is essentially the probability of the, the data given the parameter. That's something that we typically call the likelihood. And we might want to actually, in statistics, we can inter in Bayesian statistics, we can interpret the inference problem as trying to essentially convert the statement about this likelihood term here into a statement about, well, what do we know about theta given y? But in order to do that, we need to essentially now have ra joint randomness for theta and y, and we can then apply Bayes' theorem. Okay, I've written this as proportional here. Uh, this is a distribution in theta, and the fact that it's proportional is a nice, um, is a nice property, and, and, and essentially we don't necessarily need to know what p of y is. And that turns out to be practically very relevant for modern statistics. Um, so often all we do is we multiply these two things together. Um, but, um, well, so what in some sense is this doing is it's saying, I need to stipulate P of theta. What's P of theta? P of theta is some measure of, of, of uh, distribution on the parameter space before we've actually observed any data. So we call this the prior distribution. 
So P thesis of prior distribution, which is modified on observation of the likelihood, the data, the likelihood here, to give us the posterior distribution. Okay? So this is the prior, our prior beliefs and our posterior beliefs. And this gives us a completely coherent mechanism for, for saying, I believe this, then I observe some data, now I believe that. Okay? Because it's, it's all part of the probabil probabilis probabilistic framework, which um, has a complete model for theta and why that's going to be entirely consistent by the laws of probability. Okay, okay. There's uh, there's lots of details and things, but in some sense, this is a this is a beautiful way of expressing things, which is uh, very useful. Um, but what went wrong? Some something actually went wrong. So our hero Thomas Bayes, um, he'd done something fantastic. He discovered this theorem um, well before statistics as a sort of um, Discipline, or as, uh, uh, was was consciously observed. I mean, because some people in the 19th century were doing things which today we might call statistics, but there wasn't anything coherently called statistics. Um, and it was really the tw in the 20th century where classical statistics had an in incredibly successful time at um, at essentially uh, at sort of developing paradigms for how to do statistical inference. And at that time, uh, 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 there was very little, certainly in the first 80 years of the 20th century, there wasn't much impact of Bayesian statistics in this way. So just to go move on to say what, so essentially, um, so what did he do? He, he, it was a beautiful, clean, coherent, mathematically elegant framework for inference. What more could you want? That's basically what the world should need to do, statistics. statistics. But unfortunately, um, it didn't work out that way or fortunately, depending on which way you look at things, um, it turns out that classical statistics did an extremely good job of, of actually, actually um, pushing a different paradigm, which had a lot of success, and for many very good reasons, I should say. But actually, the reasons why Bayesian statistics uh, was not successful are not so much philosophical, really. I mean, certainly, certainly one issue is, is that the, the, the need to specify subjectively a prior distribution before you actually um, uh, um, before you actually see any data is something that obviously has controversy as attached to it and it can be actually something that's very difficult to specify even for professional Bayesian statisticians um, but actually then that's what we're going to focus on today really I think much more important was the issue of computation um, statistics Bayesian statistics typically requires you to do some kind of integration um, some kind of um, summation over the state space or integration to get some kind of answers. Classical statistics typically just involve um, maximizations. Uh, maximizations can use the full force of calculus, approximation calculus, numerical analysis, the sort of things which were very, very well established in mathematics, a lot of them in the 19th century. Um, so that essentially meant the Bayesian statistics was limited to actually look at really rather simple problems. And we'll see um, um, more of that in a minute. Um, I wanted to point out, because I didn't want to imply here in any sense that the first 80 years of the 20th century was wasted time and nobody did anything useful in Bayesian statistics. That's absolutely far from the truth. Um, um, there was, there's lots of very, very beautiful Bayesian statistics uh, it's, 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 uh, it's philosophical foundations, it's connections with probability theory, um, it's, it's connections with statistical modelling, all kinds of things were done, but in terms of its impact on applied statistics, uh, it was really rather limited. Okay, so uh, let, let's just sort of see a little bit more about why this is true. So assume, I'm going to assume in this argument the thesis is just a, a one-dimensional uh, real-valued parameter, and uh, we, we might be interested in asking a question like, okay, so if you've got a posterior distribution, you might want to summarize that in some way. So we might be interested in the posterior probability that uh, theta is less than or equal to some, some value u. Okay, and th this, you can just using the formulae on the couple of, of uh, uh, slides away, can be written as a ratio of two integrals. And one dimension, of course, these integrals are things which even in the uh, beginning of the 20th century are things that we wouldn't be too worried about. But you can see that these integrals are going to get uh, higher dimensional as you get more and more parameters to look at. And actually, this, this severely restricts what you can do. OK, so this is potentially difficult and restrictive. Um, so basically, our, our ability to do Bayesian analysis, actually, like much of science, is actually inexorably linked to 
um, basically our ability to carry out integrations on, on the, over the parameter space. And therefore, Bayesian statistics in the first, first sort of 70 years of the of 20th century was essentially linked to relatively simple uh, applications. Um, but there, are, there were some rays of hope, and these are things which were developed by the sort of early Bayesians in the 20th century. Uh, and one of them is the notion of conjugacy. Uh, so what was conjugacy? I mean, and I'm just giving an example, and this, I, I promise, is the slide which actually has the most maths on. Um, so uh, suppose I have, uh, this is a very simple example, I have a data which comes from an exponential distribution with a parameter theta. Well, um, the, the, you can write down the likelihood for that, which uh, don't worry too much about how you do that, but essentially you end up with an expression that looks like this, which is the power of theta times an exponential function of minus theta times some sum of the data. Okay. And now if it turns out that um, if our prior distribution for such an example is in the gamma family, well a gamma family distribution always has this form, which is a power of theta times an exponential of some multiple of theta, which is exactly the same format. Um, so the posterior distribution, just by multiplying the two together, is, is, is similarly going to have the same nice features. It's going to be the power of theta times an exponential of a multiple of theta, which we can therefore just recognize as a gamma distribution with these parameters. Okay? And this is the property, this closure property, the, the property that if you start off with a prior distribution in a particular family, in this case a gamma family, then you remain in the gamma family no matter what data you've observed and the only thing that you really need to know about is actually what the parameters actually of this gamma distribution actually are. And that's very nice because then you're summarizing, the, um, as you see more data, you, you're actually summarizing this whole distribution just in terms of these two numbers and that doesn't depend on which particular data you observe. So this is a very nice property. There's no integrations here. You don't need any integrations and that's very nice. And one of the very, very nice features of, of, of Bayesian statistics for small dimensional distributions is, is that there are many examples in which you can do conjugacy. Okay, it works very well, especially in one dimension. So there are many conjugate families. If you've got data that's normally distributed or data that's gamma distributed or whatever, this is a very common situation. However, this idea just does not really extend in a very natural way to higher dimensional problems. So even though conjugacy does work well for one-dimensional families, it typically won't work well in high dimensions. It doesn't even do all one-dimensional situations in a very nice way, but it certainly can do many interesting cases. Okay, so this is why sort of Bayesian statistics uh, in the sort of this 70s and 80s restricted to low, relatively low-dimensional statistical models um, where either you could do numerical approximations, um, various kind of quadrature kind of methods to investigate posterior distribution. Um, I should say that even though it's true that this, you know, that this, this was a, this was some, something of a restriction, it turns out new ways of looking at these kind of old techniques has made actually quite a considerable co comeback um, in recent years in, in, in ways to approximate things like high dimensional posterior distributions, um, at least in certain specialized cases. And I'm sort of an admirer of the work of Havad Rua, who's I think done very good work in this area. Um, so the challenge is to basically find some way of utilising um, the one-dimensional tractability that we actually have uh, from conjugacy and similar things um, to actually study much, much higher dimensional posterior distributions. Okay, so that's, that's basically the challenge. Um, I want to say something, and, and another thing that was happening at the time was that people were getting very interested in the notion of hierarchical models constructing the idea of, of a statistical model for some kind of complex situation, some kind of complex uh, environment, and trying to model that in some sense in some hierarchical way. Um, and what do I mean by this? Well, so, so I'm just going to give an example here. You might have um, a collection of children, all the children in Mexico, this is probably completely false, I don't know how, how education works in Mexico, but suppose it was this, we might have data on all the children in Mexico sitting some exam. You might tell me children in Mexico don't sit exams, I don't know. But suppose the child, yeah, but you, you might be interested in every child attend, attends a certain class in a particular school. So actually you'll need to know about their school. But actually the school themselves is in a particular region 
of a particular city. And we, and we know regions are different in, the, in the socioeconomic status, etc. And cities are different also. Um, we might also be interested in the fact that cities actually have different structures and different things. And there may be other covariates that come into play. Um, but there's a kind of hierarchical structure here, starting from the very detailed um, issues of, of a collection of children sitting in a class with one particular teacher in a particular school, down to the perhaps the bigger questions about um, what's actually happening to education in Mexico. So you might be interested in basically what's happening. Um, in, to, to, if, if you were a politician, you might be interested in, in, in children in Mexico overall. Um, and you might also be interested in some kind of teacher effect. You know, are there good teachers or are there bad teachers? This is a question at another level of a hierarchy. So now you want to compare different classes with each other. But you might also be interested in individual variation. So all of these aspects here are aspects in which you might want to ask those questions. But you might want to construct the model uh, in a kind of hierarchical way. So what you might do is something like this. Do it bit by bit. So, first of all, have some statistical model for what happens in every class. Okay? If you've got class, you've got in, in the UK, classes typically have about 30 children. I don't know, maybe it's a lot less in, in Mexico, I don't know. But you know, you've only got 30 individuals in, in a class. You've got one teacher. Everything's pretty common in terms of the way they're taught. Um, there's going to be a, a, a pretty easy a natural statistical model you can actually have for that. But you'd have a separate model for every single class. But then you'd want to use structure among the classes as well. So at the st second stage of a hierarchy, we would create a model for the way the variation between the classes of an individual school actually happened. And at the third stage, you might want to look for variation between schools in a region. And then you might want to do this. So in principle, you could have many, many levels to this hierarchical model. But the point is that each one of these models, each one of these levels of these models, is something that's very easy to produce via a little sub-model. And the parameters that I introduce at each of these stages are going to be parameters which are highly interpretable in terms of whatever I get out. So, so these models have a huge advantage. And one of, the, one of the real challenges was that actually you do this and you think, well, this sounds like a fairly simple thing to do. You've got, I've got a very simple model here. Maybe each of the children may be considered to be independent and identically distributed in a particular class. And then perhaps every class might be independent and identically dis dis distributed in a, in a school. And you might have very simple models going down here. But actually the overall model could be really very complicated. So, for instance, how many school classes are there in, a, in, 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 in Mexico? Well, it's probably quite a large number. I, mean, I, I don't quite know um, how I'd estimate that, but um, you could probably estimate that yourselves. But it's a, it's a large number. And every one of those classes ha is going to have its own parameters. So this model, even though it may look quite interpretable and quite simple, and I haven't been, obviously I haven't been precise about it, is something that is going to be extremely high dimensional in terms of inference. So there's a real challenge to statisticians to, to actually do this. And, and actually using the structure here is very important. Because if you were just to say, let's ignore the structure, and let's take the million children or whatever, let's take all their marks, and let's have a very simple model for that. Well, you're ignoring the structure, and you would expect, and you do, lose a lot statistically from actually ignoring all the structure that you know is there. OK. Um, so, so that's, that's the other thing. So we wanted, uh, Bayesians wanted to do more complicated things, uh, particularly things like hierarchical models. So Monte Carlo integration, um, okay, so this is, it's actually since, really since the, the Second World War, Monte Carlo integration has been recognized as a way to approximate integrals. And essentially here, I'm just writing an integral I, I've written as a Lebesgue integral here, is an expectation with respect to some density F of H over F. You could choose F to be various things, and the efficiency of this estimator might be different. But essentially, this is a very general technique that you could use. But the trouble of this is, is if you try and approximate um, any uh, high-dimensional integral uh, using this kind of method in a naive way, unless you're very lucky or very clever, then these, these methods will suffer from the cursor dimensionality, which typically means that the um, complexity of this, or the, the computational cost of actually doing this calculation to a, a desired accuracy, will increase typically exponentially 
uh, with the, the uh, dimension of the problem. So this isn't something that in its naive way is something that can be uh, adopted. Um, but, I mean, so maybe this could be overcome with, with computing power. We know, of course, we know that in the second half of the, of the uh, 20th century, computing power is being doubling every 10 years. Well, it's not anymore, but it was then. Um, so maybe computing power could actually just completely kill this problem. It turns out that's not, not the case, and that, that really um, the, the trouble is, is that when the computer scientists produce a, 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 quicker, um, a quicker computer, um, it turns out that actually we want that the scientists actually want more. They actually want much, much more complicated models, um, and so actually the computational challenges for actually doing the integration become actually harder rather than easier. Um, and the solution really came from from this this group that work in Los Alamos around the war, um, and uh, this the, the paper that's typically uh, um, referenced, although it's not the first, is Metropolis Rosenbluth Rosenbluth Teller and Teller. The second, third, and fourth, and fifth authors were married couples. I think that's, a, that's a how they did research in those days. They only had time to um, meet people when they were doing their research, so they got married. Um, um, so this, the, uh, the, this, the algorithm that came out of this was, became Metropolis, who, who was, I don't know, he may well have been married, but uh, his, his, uh, his wife was actually not. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's a very interesting paper, I mean, in, an incredibly powerful. Um, the, the last author, or maybe the, I'm one of these tellers, is actually Edward Teller, the, the teller who actually invented the hydrogen bomb. And so, you know, the, the joke normally, normally runs that uh, Edward Teller invented two very dangerous things in his life. Um, um, so, and um, certainly the Metropolis argument in the wrong hands uh, can actually be a very dangerous thing to actually use. But, um, but it turns out to be a very natural um, thing. And it turns out that, you know, I mean, as usual, statisticians are miles behind the physicists. Um, uh, and it took, it took really statisticians to about 35 years before they realized that, that the kind of ideas that they were coming up with in Los Alamos were exactly the right thing. In fact, ironically, they were more suited for statistical problems than they were for the original physics problems that the, that the physicists were looking at. Um, so what's the key idea? So these are um, important people. So this is, uh, this is Markov, uh, the inventor of, the, um, of the, the, the Markov chain. Um, Markov chain, which is very extremely, probably the most studied object in probability theory. Um, uh, a fantastically beautiful theory that we now have for it. Um, and uh, it turns out, so this, this guy's Metropolis on the right here. Um, so what Metropolis did is he took a Markov chain and he, and he constructed it in a, in a very simple but very effective way uh, in order to have a limiting distribution that was exactly the thing you were interested in. Um, so in some sense, um, the idea here was not to try and do the simulation um, of a distribution, a posterior distribution, um, exactly, um, straight away, but to sort of do it bit by bit by having a Markov chain that would slowly kind of converge towards it, or perhaps quite quickly converge towards it if you were lucky. Okay. And to do this, they have a, a simple mechanism called Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. Okay, and I haven't got a picture of Hastings because I haven't been able to fa find one. Hastings only really published, I think, a, sort of a, a couple of papers. He's Canadian, and um, uh, I, I couldn't find one on the internet, so I apologize for that. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to describe the algorithm because it's incredibly simple. Many of you know already. Um, we're, now we're interested in, in exploring some high dimensional distribution pi. Okay, so this is just a density pi. And we have some Markov chain mechanisms. So we've got a Markov chain that we could actually carry out on that state space. Okay, and that Markov chain has a transition density given by Q. So QXY is the density that we propose a Y value given that we're currently, currently, currently at X. Now if I was to just carry out Q and do nothing else and just carry out that Markov chain, then obviously that would have no connection whatsoever to do with pi. So I need to have some way of correcting the mistakes made by Q in order to have the correct invariant distribution, the correct limiting distribution of the Markov chain. So a single iteration of the algorithm just works very simply in the following way. It says, let's first of all propose a candidate Y from this density, from this distribution. And now I'm going to decide, do I like it or not? And I, I, I like it, if I like it, I accept it. 
and I accept it with a probability alpha, where alpha is just the minimum of 1, and this ratio here. And this is the only bit in which pi, the target distribution, actually comes in. And if I, if I manage to accept, then, the out, then I output what is this, this iteration of the algorithm outputs y. Otherwise, I, I reject and I stay at the current impact value x. And it turns out this is exactly the right accept-reject mechanism in order to have distribution pi. But it's an incredible, uh, incredibly powerful and general technique because I could, in principle, start with pretty much any proposal kernel Q. And obviously, some will do better than others um, and that's a lot of what the emphasis of Markov Chain Monte Carlo researchers these days trying to find the right cues in order that this procedure will work with a relatively small number of iterations. Okay. So this is so the other, okay. So that's one mechanism. So in some sense, that's one mechanism. And then the second mechanism is something which is in, can be thought of as a special case of the first mechanism, but has a different flavour, particularly in statistical problems. Okay. And it's basically, uh, it's a sort of divide and conquer thing. It's saying I've got a high dimensional distribution here, um, th uh, which has components theta 1 up to theta k. And I want to break down this k-dimensional simulation into smaller dimensional chunks. I want to basically uh, actually write it down as the uh, simulations for each of these thetas separately. So I want to break it down essentially into k one-dimensional simulations. And then what the Gibbs sampler does in turn is it simulates from the distribution of theta i condition on all the other components. So it, it simulates from the conditional distributions. And then this is where conjug conjugacy comes in. Because if you condition on all the other components, this is like we're in a one-dimensional inference problem in which theta i is the only thing that's unknown. And all the work of the t first 80 years of the 20th century where, where conjugate families were being worked out can actually be used to actually carry out this step in many examples. Okay, so this turns out to be a perfect fit for Bayesian, um, for the Bayesian low dimensional conjugacy pro property. And so we can implement this algorithm and we can get things working um, in, in a, in a k-dimensional setting. And one of the amazing things about the, the Gibbs sampler is, is that in many situations, um, the properties of the algorithm are really very high so that even when k is something like a thousand or a million even in some cases, actually this algorithm can actually converge really quite quickly. And there are very interesting links between that property, the fact that the algorithm works very quickly, and the statistical models that we actually uh, produce. But I, I haven't really got time to go into that. OK, I was going to, yeah, OK. This was my, I, I, I spoiled my own joke now. OK, so uh, this is where I come in, in some sense. So I, I got my first academic job at Nottingham in the 19, uh, 19, uh, about 1988. And I, I was going to work with um, someone called Adrian Smith. So my first thought was, Adrian Smith, I'm going to work with the famous rock guitarist, Adrian Smith. I thought this is fantastic, he'll be incredibly inspiring. Um, unfortunately, when I got there, I was a little bit disappointed to find, oh, it's not a very good picture either. He looks, he looks a lot more handsome than that. Uh, but um, uh, I was working with uh, Adrian Smith, but it, it, it turned out that this Adrian Smith was actually every bit as inspiring to me as the other uh, Adrian Smith. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a big fan of rock music, so that's why. Uh, but he turned out to be very inspiring. And in fact, being in Nottingham at 1988 was exactly the right time, because it's about the time when statisticians were discovering Markov Chain Monte Carlo methods, of which the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is the sort of main one, and, uh, and basically discovering how to use them, in particular on, on hierarchical models. Um, this is where we spend most of our time, obviously, it seems. Uh, we, we worked very hard at those times. We used to spend a lot of time discussing work in the pub. Um, and uh, I don't know, Andres, I know, do you remember that pub? <laughs> it, it's, it's called the Three Wheat Sheaves. It's in Nottingham. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I found out something. <laughs> yeah, you see, he was so, so drunk that he didn't even... Yeah, yeah. But, but actually, the, the thing about this pub was that the... Um, I, I recent, so all, all the people that were involved in the group that Andres and I were involved in, the MCMC Bayesian Statistics Group at that time, um, we, we had quite a, quite a close-knit community. There was probably about sort of 15, 20 people, or maybe as many as that. Uh, well, certainly 15. And, and uh, we, well, we spent quite a long time there. And, and I did a bit of research a while ago to find out something about this particular pub. And it turns out it closed down shortly after we left because they actually didn't have enough trade. <laughs> I think so. Uh, uh, but actually, it's opened again, and this was a new picture. 
Um, uh, so I know I want to say something about the um, ex sort of exciting uh, people that, that made the, these initial contributions. Um, so this is Adrian. Um, this is Alan Gelfand, and Gelfand and Smith. Uh, so it's actually so Gelfand visited uh, Nottingham in 1988 uh, and other t times as well, and they worked on this idea of actually applying the Gibbs sampler to Gibbs sampler uh, to uh, to hierarchical models and related things. Um, today, one could look at their initial work and say that really wasn't a good way to do it. But actually, the concepts were amazing. And, and the fact that they got incredible, um, incredibly complicated models for those days to work in a situation where, um, basically, there was no hope for Bayesian statistics before was incredibly exciting. Um, other people, so Peter Green, I must mention, also did some fantastic stuff, particularly in image analysis. And in fact, in image analysis, which is obviously very statistical, um, there was people doing there was quite a lot of people doing image and, uh, uh, MCMC type things uh, before, uh, before it was generally used in statistics. That also applies to um, Julian uh, Bizag. And, and I wanted to mention David Spiegelhalter as well, as, as not someone that was, I guess, an MCMC specialist in terms of MCMC, but he was the first person to have the, the great idea of trying to get generic software so that people who weren't statistical experts could do MCMC. And this is software um, which is still used today, and in fact is being built upon in this, uh, in this very building, so one of the telling me earlier. So, um, so see, these are some of the uh, pioneers. There are other, other, many other people, and I apologize if I've missed out your favorite person. Um, so, okay, we talked, that, so, so hierarchical models were great, and, and it turned out that they were an incredibly natural fit. Why did they work so well? Well, I can't tell you that, but they do work well, and it turns out there's some very interesting mathematical properties of statistical hierarchical models which link to good properties of Gibbs samplers and other Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. Um, people start to look at really complicated models. This is actually a, a genetic um, hierarchical model which is in which the hierarchical structure is, is, is expressed in terms of these arrows. Incredibly complex models like this, or even much, much more complicated again, in which um, uh, people could actually carry out things like MCMC algorithms really rather quickly. Oh, and I just wanted to give you one of my own examples, because this is, this is something I can tell you a little bit about. This is work I've done quite recently, um, sort of in, in sort of about maybe about five years ago. Um, foot and mouth disease is a, is a very important uh, economic disease in, in the UK, in that um, it's a very infectious disease of cows and sheep, typically. And I was uh, asked in 2007 to do a sort of an online analysis by the British government of basically uh, farms that I thought that, that we thought might actually be at risk of contracting uh, this disease and this is quite a complicated uh, stochastic epidemic model involved in this um, and I just wanted to show you uh, that this the, the color coding here the color coding is, is is that the red dots the very red dots are the ones which have the highest probability current probability of being infected because you can't go to every farm you don't know whether a farm is infected or not um, the blue dots here are the ones which we know at any particular time are infected. The green dots are basically the ones which uh, actually have a, a slightly lower probability of being infected, but we don't know. And, all the, and basically there are some other farms which don't light up at all, which basically have a, a, a much lower uh, probability of being infected. This is very important because they needed to know which farms were most likely to be infected, and they had a, a, only a finite amount of capacity for checking out farms. So it's useful to know this. Um, this, was, this analysis was done essentially on, um, on all the farms in the whole country, at least in principle it was. There are 200,000 fa uh, such farms. So in, in any particular day, then you've got each of these 200,000 200, farms has a latent variable attached to it, which the MCMC has to estimate. So this is, this is a sort of upwards of a 200,000 dimensional problem, which we basically had to solve. And just to get, you know, you might not be that interested in this, but this is how things emerged, how proceeded through days. This was the next day. This is the day after that. You see there's less dots here because actually we didn't get any new cases in that last day. And then no new cases again, so there's less red dots. And now the green dots start disappearing because the risk is smaller. The green, a few more there because there was an extra case. And then the green dots started disappearing again. And then they disappear and that's it. Okay, so that was that was the analysis that we did for them, but it was a um, that just essentially would have been impossible without, without um, Metropolis Hastings algorithms. Okay, so the, so now I'm going to come to the third part of the talk, which is to say that actually this all sounds great, but it turns out there's more to do. 
Um, so the, the last two decades have seen a huge expansion of Marco Train Monte Carlo techniques. Um, Andres is, is organizing a, a little conference in Cancun, uh, which we're expecting something like um, 600 people, um, and that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg of the number of people doing Bayesian statistics. There's, the, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them these days. Um, if, if he'd been organizing that conference 20 years ago, he would have had about a, t a tenth of that number of people coming to the conference. And Monte Carlo is, is completely uh, fundamental to mo almost all everything that goes on. Um, so computers have been, I've got quicker, right? So our knowledge of algorithms has become much better. We've become much more experienced. We have much better theory for how these things work. So what, what can go wrong? Everything's fine, right? So we can do everything now, hopefully. But it turns out that some, uh, many, many of the really hard problems today, especially 21st century problems, are still, are actually beyond the scope of kind of currently available likelihood methods. Um, okay, so why is this? So, um, why is this? But basically, um, complicated people, uh, science, scientists always want more. They're greedy. They want more. So you want basically to consider all the time complex models which are getting more and more complicated to, uh, and, design, and designed to answer even more sort of kind of subtle questions. And they're characterized by infinite, sometimes infinite dimensional, certainly high dimensional distributions for, for parameter spaces. So p people are getting much, much more ambitious about the kind of statistical models they want to fit. But crucially, connected to that is massive data. Massive data, we all know about massive data, it's everywhere. Um, it should be a great thing for statistics, but it turns out um, that it causes all kinds of problems. Often likelihoods are, are actually too, too expensive to even compute. It may be that you have 10 to the 9 individuals, and you need to do some kind of um, summation over 10 to the 9 individuals to actually point-wise calculate a likelihood function. That's typically not going to be feasible in these situations. So even though massive data is a fantastic opportunity for statisticians, uh, it also causes specific problems. And something, uh, again, I know a number of people here working on inverse problems where actually likelihoods are not necessarily um, uh, impossible to calculate, but they're sort of only, only known in some sense implicitly. Um, and then again, uh, we may actually need to, uh, to th find some ways of, of, of doing something different. Okay. Um, so uh, there's, there's various new ideas that are coming in, which I think many of them are very exciting. I just want to mention a few things here. Um, composite likelihood approximation methods for Bayesian statistics. Things like ABC, which I know Andres is a big fan of. Um, um, I'm not a huge fan of it either, but actually um, it's here to stay in the sense that it's a, it's, a, it's a technique that many people are using and it's important that statisticians and, and, uh, engage with it because it's going to be a methodology that will always do be able to do slightly more things than perhaps more principled methods. Uh, adaptive Monte Carlo methods, which uh, are very sort of popular now and, and uh, being used in situations where we need to improve our Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm as things progress. And these last two, I'm going to, I'm going to say something about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about pseudo marginal MCMC. Very little, actually, but I'll tell you something about it at least. And I want to also tell you something about retrospective. Um, Monte Carlo, again, I'll just tell you a little, little bit, mainly in terms of the story. Okay, so, so I want to tell you, so this is, this is really the problem of intractable likelihood. So traditionally, Metropolis Hastings is fine as long as you can calculate this accept reject probability alpha. And here I've written it out explicitly in terms of a posterior, which is the prior times the likelihood on the top and the bottom. But these red terms are, of course, um, the potentially difficult ones to actually handle. Um, so it turns out that, so one breakthrough is, is that you can, you can do something called pseudo-marginal MCMC, which turns out that, uh, I've said replace the red and blue, but they're both red. Replace these red observations, essentially replace the thing that you don't know by an unbiased estimator. It turns out that if you can actually do this and replace it by an unbiased estimator, it turns out that that doesn't mess things up. You know, you, it, it, if you do it in the right way, then you can still have a Markov chain which has exactly the right stationary distribution, even if there's residual um, um, ver uh, um, randomness in these unbiased estimators. Okay? So essentially, we can replace the problem of function evaluation by the problem of producing unbiased estimates of the thing we want to unbiasedly uh, estimate, uh, of, the, of the likelihood. 
Okay, so, um, and it turns out that there are many situations in which that's possible. And the challenge really for, for uh, pseudo-marginal MCMC is to find methods where that uh, unbiased estimation can be done relatively efficiently um, in high dimensions. It's always going to get harder in high dimensions, but you want it to be relatively efficient. Um, so that's one. The, set, the other one I wanted to talk about was retrospective simulation. Uh, and this is something that I really enjoyed working on in the last few years because it's incredibly simple. But it turns out that there are a, a loads of interesting examples. And what retrospective simulation does is it just takes traditional algorithms, typically, and it, it fiddles around with them by changing the order of various steps. So in principle, it's very, very easy to describe. It turns out that the mathematics of getting this to work in, in complicated situations sometimes makes um, uh, so sometimes gets very complicated. So there's very interesting mathematical problems that come out of actually trying to implement retrospective simulation. But at least in principle, it's very simple. I personally am interested in this in terms of simulation problems in infinite dimensional contexts. And it turns out you can do infinite dimensional simulation in some appropriate sense without any approximations. And um, that's all due to retrospective simulation, which you could, you obviously you'd have to do some kind of approximation if you didn't have this. And I'm just going to give you an example of, um, of a very, very, possibly the first, um, the first retrospective simulation algorithm that I came up with um, because it relates to my childhood. Uh, but I'm actually going to put it in a, a Mexican context. Um, so this is, um, so I, I actually was brought up in, in, uh, in Liverpool in the 1970s. And at that time, it was the beginning of sort of mass television for children. Um, and they had these Saturday morning television programs in which children uh, would, were invited to answer a question that was typically not very difficult. And, um, um, and the, the, it was typically very difficult to, to try, and, uh, um, not difficult so that children were encouraged to actually enter the competition. And what they did was they put their name on a postcard and they put their answer and then they would actually send the postcard uh, to the BBC. And the BBC, the following Saturday, all the children would watch again because they want to know if they've won. And they would watch the programme again and they would get, come and get some celebrity um, to come onto the, tele uh, onto the program, onto the live television program, and to actually pick out the winner. So, what the BBC, so, so essentially what the BBC did was, um, they, they had all these entries, there were a large number of entries, I mean this was so popular, all the children I knew, they wanted to play these games, wanted to enter this competition. Nowadays, children don't have the attention span to wait a whole week. But in those days, we did, because we had to. Um, and so, so, it was very popular, and the number of children entering was really quite large. Okay? Uh, N was really quite large. So the, the, the effort that the BBC had to go to to actually find out which ones were correct and which ones were not was actually um, quite considerable. Okay? So I found out something very useful on Saturday. I found out the answer to this question. Um, I think I can probably remember it, but I'm not going to... Is that just in case I get it wrong? Um, um, but essentially, the, the, the structure of these questions was always that was that there was one that was completely ridiculous. Well, you might think there's two that were ridiculous here, but the one that's completely ridiculous, and then maybe so. So actually, even if you didn't know anything at all, then then the chances are you'd get this right with at least a probability of half. So you think, oh, it must be worth entering then. So this is what what they what they did. So, um, and I was concerned at the time because I thought, well, BBC are wasting an awful lot of time actually marking these because most of them are going to be right. You know, because even if you don't know the answer, you might ask your parents. Okay, so this is this is algorithm one, which is what the BBC claimed they were doing. So mark each, oh, um, sorry, mark each of the n entries. Place the correct postcards into a bucket. Um, shake the bucket and then pick out the winner. The, the celebrity picks out a winner and says, "This is the winner." And the winner this week is um, Andres. Um, but I had a better idea, and I never told the BBC about this, but I, maybe I should have done. Um, um, I, the, the, the answer now, which um, is, is that basically you throw all the postcards into a bucket without marking them. So essentially you do, um, you, you basically don't do step one. Now, and now basically we take out a postcard, and we take out a postcard and, and, uh, and we basically see if it's, uh, if it's correct or not. So obviously the number of postcards we need to pick out is going to be random and in fact the expected number of postcards we need to pick is going to be 
something like um, order p to the minus 1, but if, if p is not too small, then that's not going to be very large. So algorithm 1 is massively inefficient compared to algorithm 2. Algorithm 2 has the big problem that actually uh, for live television it's not necessarily the best thing. Because you, if you take out a postcard and you announce to the, to the whole Mexican nation that Andres is the winner, and then it turns out that Andres had actually thought it was uh, this, um, yeah. Then, then of course he would be a laughing stock of all his, uh, his uh, school, school friends, whatever. And so, so it doesn't work particularly well on, on live television. Um, um, so why is this, uh, so this is retrospective, this is a simple, very simple retrospective simulation because all you're doing is really, you're changing the order of these two things. You're picking out a winner and then deciding if it really is a winner. Um, instead of actually doing it. So, so an incredibly simple idea, but it gives you a, a gain of efficiency that's order n. And you can pl apply these kind of retrospective ideas to Markov chain Monte Carlo and other simulation met methods and produce really massive gains in efficiency. And this is the sort of thing that allows you to do very, some very, very high dimensional and sometimes infinite dimensional problems. Okay. Um, so, I'll go on to my conclusions. Um, so, I've, I've got my heroes up there at the top, um, Thomas Bayes and his friend Isaac Newton. Um, of course, we didn't, so, so Isaac Newton, uh, had, so they were, they were friends of, Bayes was obviously a massive um, supporter of Isaac Newton's work. He was a lot younger than Isaac Newton, so I'm not sure quite how closely they were friends. But, um, but actually, um, uh, Bayes' statistics, of course, requires, we now know it, it requires Monte Carlo Simulation that's uh, uh, for, for most of its applications. Um, Mar Marco Gian Monte Carlo uh, had a massive sustained effect on Bayesian statistics, um, which I call the first computational statistics revolution of the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and this is absolutely fantastic. Um, but it turns out that, that one thing that particularly did big data problems and some of these sort of inverse problems that we talk about which is inter sort of very interesting is, is that um, the idea of simulation and unbiased estimation um, turn out to be frequently much, much, and orders of magnitude easier to carry out than function evaluation. And we're all, all taught as mathematicians, we're typically taught um, of the, the notion of writing down functions, doing calculus with functions, doing what, what Isaac Newton would have suggested that we should do. Um, doing calculus with functions, maximizing, integrating, uh, all, all the sort of things that we, we know we can do very nicely. But how much of that functional calculus can we actually do without actually doing the function evaluation? And that's, I think, where computational statistics algorithms are going now. We want to do things like differentiate without not actually not doing any calculations, but essentially just purely Monte Carlo methods. Um, and I think so. That this is going to be the way of the future. I think to sort of, to sort of uh, utilize some of these ideas. Um, so modern intractable likelihood methods certainly require new tools, and I've mentioned some of the, some of those tools, and perhaps not in much detail, but I've maybe given at least some flavour of them. And so I think as a result of these, um, my claim is is that we're on the verge of a, a second computational statistics revolution, and there is much to do for uh, an exciting incredibly exciting uh, state that statistics is in these days uh, with so many fantastic challenges uh, out there for us to actually look at. Thank you very much.